The first and only scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke. Luke, of course, is the gospel that we have been following through much of this year, at least much of this summer, after the season of Pentecost. It is the gospel for the lectionary readings in uh, year C, and I'll actually say a bit about that uh, later on as well. But I give the same introduction now to this passage as I've given to passages for at least the last two weeks, and probably some more passages before that as well. The stage for this passage is set way back in the fourth chapter of Luke's Gospel when Jesus appears in the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown, and he is the one selected to read the scripture for the day. He reads from the prophet Isaiah, which announces that the year of the Lord's favor has come. And Jesus then sits down and says that this reading has been fulfilled in your midst. So we learn that Jesus is the one to bring the year of the Lord's favor, the day of the Lord, the kingdom of God to this world. And then we see that good news played out in the Gospel of Luke in several passages as the Gospel of uh, that good news comes to unexpected people comes to lame people and blind people and centurions, that is, the, beloved, the, 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 the hated traitors against the Jews. It comes even to women, as we see in this passage today. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, You're worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I um, realized this past week that this passage has now appeared three times in the lectionary during the past 11 years, 2010, 2007, and 2004, in the 11 years that I've been the pastor here. But each time it has appeared in the lectionary, I have avoided preaching a sermon on it. I found a sermon that I preached 12 years ago at my previous church, but going back and reading it, I was deeply dissatisfied with what I said and what I did with the passage. I went to a few of the sources that I often use to get my general bearings about a passage, and they just seemed wrong to me this time when I read the passage. I read some of the older, ancient material on this passage, like from John Calvin and from St. Augustine, and found their take on the passage to be positively offensive. I looked at the notes that were included with my study Bible, that big red one that maybe you've seen me carrying around, and even the notes in the Bible that I liked the best. I was deeply disappointed. I searched on the internet and found all sorts of utter garbage about this passage, along with some material that obviously meant well, but still didn't seem quite right to me. It is difficult indeed to figure out what is really going on in this story about Martha and Mary and Jesus. Even the self-described radical feminists can't agree on what the passage is all about. 
It's difficult indeed to read this passage in a way that is not influenced by centuries of patriarchy, or as one prominent scholar calls it, kiriarchy, that is, any form of domination, not just domination by men. It's difficult in read to read this, indeed to read this passage in a way that truly respects women and sees women as active, equal, and independent disciples of Jesus. I've had to dig deeper into the academic work surrounding this passage than I normally do, because all of that stuff, none of it seemed to work for me. I dug deeper mainly because of a conversation that I had just a few weeks ago with several people from the church at a committee meeting here at church. There are some men on this committee, but they couldn't make this particular meeting a few weeks ago, so it was me and five or six other women at the meeting. I don't even remember why, but someone said, oh, but I'm more of a Martha, meaning that she was one of those who take responsibility to see that the work gets done, to serve in the background, practice hands-on hospitality, rather than be quick to join in the party, so to speak. And then someone else said, me too. And another one said, yep, I'm a Martha. And another, and another, until again and again, all of them, I think, said that they could much more easily identify with Martha than with Mary in this passage. One of the women said, well, sure, if we've hosted a party for a family gathering or, 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 or a gathering of friends, and afterward, my husband asks if I had a good time, I say, well, did everyone else have a good time? If they did, then I did. My response to these comments was something like, oh, you know, come on. I mean, if you had a guest you didn't see very often, someone you wanted to spend time with, you wouldn't worry about all the work. You would just sit and talk and enjoy that person's presence. And they were all like, well, yeah, but somebody's got to do the work. I think I basically discounted their experience and tried to pull them Indeed, as the church has done for centuries, into the realm of Mary. And they nicely said, well, yeah, but they still knew that they were basically Marthas. I am now quite upset at myself for the way I handled that conversation in a committee a few weeks ago. To put it simply, I think now that we all missed the point of the passage, or rather we missed the point of the story if the story is what might have actually happened between Martha, Mary, and Jesus, and the passage is Luke's account of that story. In other words, I think Luke might have missed the point of the story as well. Now, to boil down a whole bunch of academic work that I read about this passage, we need to pay attention to one particular word that's used here in the original Greek, diakonin. It means, basically, service. And it is translated, poorly, I might add, in our reading today as many tasks. Somehow, we basically assume that means that Martha was busy doing everything that a good hostess should do, getting the food ready, making sure everyone had a drink and was comfortable, making sure that the dirty dishes didn't get away in the way of the guests, and so on and so forth. You know, what used to be called domestic chores, or even worse, women's work. But that is not at all what diakonin actually means. 
Deaconing, of course, is the root of deacon or diaconate, which was the word for leaders in the early church. The reference is not to domestic service, to slaving away in the kitchen. Deaconing was instead the service that was offered by the leaders of small groups of Christians that met in people's houses in the early church. You probably heard the word house churches. That's what the early church was, a collection of house churches. And those who were called diaconane were the leaders of these house churches. Martha may have been preparing a meal in this passage, at least a meal of sorts, but it was the meal that was central to the identity of the early church. The meal that embodied the inclusion of all, the equality of all, the meal that itself proclaimed that all were welcomed at the table with Jesus. The diaconane was the leadership of the early church. And that office involved hospitality, proclamation of the word, organizing this meal later to become the Eucharist, and all the other leadership responsibilities that went along with the position. Remember how the story begins? Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. This was Martha's home. And she's the one who received Jesus. This is the only time in the Gospels that a woman receives Jesus in this way. Not in a subservient position, not as a servant, but as a social equal. And furthermore, Martha in this passage is the one who speaks. She's the one who interacts with Jesus, although we certainly put a negative spin on it. She's the one who sees the injustice of the situation that is developing, and she addresses it head on. She's an active equal, and independent disciple of Jesus, and a leader in the early church. But all that comes from just the first three verses of this five-verse passage. In the last two verses, we see a change. And I think this is one of those times, as I said, when Luke as the very human writer of the gospel, sort of missed the point of the story he was telling. Basically, Martha's active, independent form of service is criticized in favor of Mary's passive, submissive form of following Jesus. Martha leads. Mary listens. Martha talks. Mary is silent. Martha decides. Mary follows. No wonder so many women at that committee meeting, and probably among you and throughout history as a matter of fact, no wonder that so many women identify with Martha in this story. As I see it, as well they should. Sadly, what we hear next is Luke. Not Jesus, mind you, but Luke saying, Yes, it's good for women to be disciples of Jesus, but women are supposed to be quiet, passive, adoring disciples, like Mary, not active, leading, speaking disciples, like Martha. And sadly as well, we see the same message elsewhere in the New Testament, where women are encouraged to be silent in worship, and if they, oh, it's painful to even say it, if they have questions, they should wait until they get home and ask their husbands. Now, that may sound preposterous to most of us, but it is there in the Bible. And worse yet, remember that for the vast majority of Christianity today, 
Yes, in 2013, perhaps upward of 80% of the church worldwide, women are not allowed to be ordained as ministers and, not, or not, and are not involved in the most important decision-making that goes on in the church. It's wrong. It's not what God intends. To be clear then, I'm all for what I think Martha actually stands for. And I'm all for you women who identify with her. Because what Martha actually stands for is not working in the kitchen and making sure that everyone else is comfortable and only then feeling good about yourself if other people feel good about themselves. But Martha stands for everyone, male or female, being active, independent, self-responsible disciples of Jesus. And that carries over into all of life, of course. Our society, if you don't see this, please listen to the experience of life of half the population. Our society still favors males and maleness in business, in entertainment, in social life, in politics. I think the best way to summarize it is to say that all too often men are the actors of the world and women are playing a role in a story that's really about men. It's wrong. It's not what God intends. In the Gospel of John, I could go into this in detail, but won't take the time today, but in the Gospel of John, this all becomes reasonably clear when women are portrayed as full and responsible disciples, as leaders, and it is there too in other places in the Bible, although sometimes, as here in Luke, you have to read between the lines to see it. The truth of our faith is that all of us, women and men, are called to be active, engaged, speaking, decision-making disciples of Jesus. We are called to be like Martha, who cares enough to do the work to welcome everyone into God's household of grace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.